I was just going to say, for those people who don't know me, my name's Linford Sweeney. I live in Manchester. Um, I've, um, I'm, I'm a, what you might call a freelance histori uh, black historian or black history educator. I'm a Jamaican genealogist as well and an author. And I do lots. I've been involved in community work in particular within my Manchester for about 40 odd years. Um, so, you know, and I've, I've sp spent a little bit of time in others field too. You know, I've got friends in others field. Yeah. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to be uh, going through a history of four uh, people that I've chosen um, that represent um, what you would call black business history. And those four people, I'm going to I'm going to go through all four. And then at the end of the session, um, we can have a Q&A. Um, so I'll basically just go through all four and we'll have the Q&A at the end. So I hope that these are people that um, you will find inspiring, motivational, and um, it, the, what you need to look out for really with these people is, is basically what drove them and um, maybe not even what drove them, but the kind of uh, personalities they had, what they, what they did to be able to do, um, to be able to do what they did. Four black British business achievers. Okay, so I'm going to start now with um, the important thing to know is that there have been black business people in this country from a, a long, long time ago, probably even going back as far as Roman times, but we haven't got that information as yet. But we definitely know about black business people from the time of the, from the 1700s and um, 1800s coming through to the 1900s. And one of the things we we need to be aware of is that, you know, black people are business like. And if we go back even further to ancient Africa and you look at the pyramids and you look at everything else, black people have been involved in all of that. Uh, Axum was one of the great trading nations of, of, the, of the world. So was Ga ancient Ghana, so was Mali, etc. So, we, you know, this is nothing new. It's been going on for a while. So I'm going to start by talking about, um, if my screen will move, I'm going to talk about the first person and his name is Pablo Fang. Um, I don't know who's heard of Pablo Fang. I, I hadn't heard of him for, until about uh, a year and a half ago. And I found that, found this guy. And um, he was born William Darby in Norwich in 1810. And he then became the first black circus owner in Britain. Okay. So he was the first black circus owner. He was also an equestrian performer. That means he performed with, the horse, with horses and a tightrope stuntman. And he owned, owned his own circus and put on performances around the country for 30 years. And I'll tell you when that began in a second and you'll be really surprised as to how he did what he did. The first, he was the first black English uh, circus owner becoming famous in Victorian Britain for his extraordinary shows. He also became proficient in horse riding and, um, and also rope dancing and acrobatics and joined one of the most famous, um, one of the most famous circus troops of the time. Records also show that he performed in Nottingham in 1836, where he was described as Pablo Fang, a Negro rope dancer. 
From 1834, he performed at the Royal Am Amphitheatre in Liverpool. And in 18 1836, he was described as the loftiest jumper in England. In 1841, Fang started his own show with two horses and the famous clown W.F. Wallet joined him and as they traveled north and uh, opening at Wakefield where Fang had erected a circus. Over the next six years, over the next six years, by his own industry and talent, he got together as fine a stud of horses and ponies as any on in England. He mostly performed in Yorkshire, which is interesting, and Lancashire. But he also traveled to Scotland, to Ireland, and other parts of England. His circus was based in its own purpose-built auditorium in Manchester, capable of holding an audience of 3,000 and always performing to full houses. In 1847, Fang made a successful London debut. The London Illustrated News reported that Mr. Pablo Fang is an artist of color. We have not only never seen surpassed, but never equaled. Mr. Pablo Fang was the hit of the evening. In 1847, he established his troupe in Manchester, outselling all his competition, which enabled him to remain there with Wallet the Clown, always performing to full houses. I think we've mentioned that before. In 1848, his wife, Susanna, who was actually a black woman, died in a freak accident when part of the pit collapsed in the circus. She was then buried in Leeds Woodhouse Cemetery. It's now part of the grounds of Leeds uh, University. And there's an open area where um, I believe his gravestone is still there. Fang continued, uh, oh, the reason I said his gravestone is that he later was buried with his wife, his first wife, this particular lady. Fang continued to perform throughout the country and his children joined him and he gave open air performances and he worked with some of the biggest names in the business at the time. Pablo Fang died in Stockport in 1871 and was buried in the grave of his first wife, which was in Leeds. The, the hearst was proceed, proceed, preceded by a band playing the Dead March, followed by Pablo's favorite horse, four coaches and his family and friends. And this, uh, interestingly enough, is one of the posters from one of his farewell benefits, which I'll mention. He was accepted by both the circus. Are you still hearing me? Yeah, you dropped out for a few. You dropped out for a few seconds, Linford, but you're back on loud and clear yes, now. Yes, yes, I've just noticed that. Um, just to let me go back, he died in Stockport in 1871 and was buried in the grave of his first wife. The hearse was preceded by a band playing the Dead March, followed by Pablo's favorite horse, four coaches, and his family and friends. Fang was accepted by both the circus fraternity, but also um, and and also the general public. There is no documentary evidence so far that has found that he encountered racism. In the picture, 
you will also see um, one of the Beatles. This is John Lennon. And they actually had, um, John Lennon found this and he included this on one of his albums and it's called The Benefit of Mr. Kite. So it's even in the 60s, you know, the, the, they, they, they eventually found and as a result of this, oh, sorry. As a result of this, um, people started realizing that this man existed because very few people knew he existed. Also, this is Pablo Fang House, which is in Norwich, where he was born. And this now houses about uh, somewhere in the region, about 240 student, uh, student accommodation. It saw Reverend Thomas Horn, um, chaplain of the Showman's Guild, 90, in 1901, said about Fang, in the great brotherhood, of the equestrian world, there is no color line. For although Pablo Fang was of African extraction, he speedily made his way to the top of his profession. The camaraderie of the ring, just one second, my, my computer keeps on moving. <laughs> um, the camaraderie of the ring has but one test, ability. People referred to Fang as a man of color or as an artist of color. He was well respected. Fang was a generous man and often held charity performances to raise money. He was extremely good at attracting um, poor people away from their drab, hardworking lives into a world of imagination, color, dangerous feats of courage, expertise, and sheer fun and again there's another poster that was made last night but three being for the benefit of mr kite and this is a plaque that has actually um is in um that has been put up at his uh, in norwich a blue plaque for mr uh, for um pablo frank uh, frank an extremely gifted type rope walker as i said i think i've mentioned all of this uh, he built up a fine stable of horses and ponies. Uh, also an outstanding trainer of horses and is said to have ridden out with the Duke of Wellington in Hyde Park. His feats of showmanship were renowned particularly with his favorite black mare, Bida, with whom he performed in front of the Queen and Royal family. That was Queen Victoria and the royal family at Astley, uh, Astley's famous amphitheatre on Westminster Bridge Road, London in 1847. Okay, so that's, that's, um, that is uh, all about uh, Pablo Fang. And if you've not heard about him before, this is a man to find out more about because he was doing something at a time when you know uh, slavery existed when he was born that's really what we when he first got into the circus um it, he, he was about 11 years old that's about 1820 and so slavery hadn't been abolished in the british um, isles until uh, the uh, 1834 so this man was doing this at that particular point in time okay Let's move on to the next person. And the person we'll be looking at is T. Rasmakonen. Now, T. Rasmakonen was born in 1909 and he died in 1983 in Nairobi, in Kenya. He was a Guyanese born Pan African financier and activist. His birth name was George Thomas N. Griffith. In 1927, he moved to Texas um, um, in the USA to study min mineralogy. In 1935, he changed his name in solidarity with the African cause and particularly relating to Ethiopia and what was going on there at the time when the Italians were fighting against the Ethiopians to take over Ethiopia. 
He was also a gifted speaker and he, he obtained speaking engagements around the US. In 1932, he attended Cornell University to study uh, agriculture. And he was very much involved in the Ethiopian crisis. He spoke to many students who, uh, from Ethiopia who were in America, who were concerned about the crisis. And um, he then participated in the agitation against high rents um, within um, that part of uh, America. He, he was a member of the Libyan uh, Institute, which members read learned papers on aspects of Africa and what was going on in Africa during colonial times. He attended meetings of black socialists and communists. He also met Jomo Kenyatta, who went on to become president of Kenya, and also Jamaican-born the uh, Theophilus um, Scholes, who was a Baptist um, pre uh, pastor who had written quite a number of books. He was then actively engaged in debates of those days. He then moved to Europe in 1935, which is when he eventually decided to change his name. He then shared a platform with C.L.R. James, the writer of the Black Jacobins, and also Jomo Kenyatta when they were all in London together. Haley Selassie visited the city of Bath in 1935, and, um, and he was, um, uh, McConan was part of the delegation that welcomed him to the city of Bath. He then worked to publicize the Ethiopian crisis, settled in London in 1937, and he was a member of the International African Service Bureau as business manager. He was a founder member of the Pan-African Federation in mid-1936. He also had involvement in the, the International African Friends of Abyssinia. Abyssinia was the name for Ethiopia at the time, um, um, or the, the name that Ethiopia, you know, used for quite a, a long time. And it, that group was chaired by CLR James and included Jomo Kenyatta again. The IASB organized protest meetings and sent speakers, including McConan, as far afield as Belfast and Scotland. McConan himself is described by uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who then later on in 1957 became um, president of Ghana. Um, he described him as a gifted speaker. So now you're all wondering, What's this got to do with business? Well, I'm coming on to that. In 1939, McConan moved to Manchester. He then opened two restaurants, a bookshop, a publishing company, a mail order service, an exclusive nightclub, and also bought several houses. And those houses were used to house black people who couldn't find anywhere else to live because of the color bar or racism in this country at that time. All did exceptionally well. And the profits from these businesses went directly towards his political work. In 1945, he helped to organize the fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester. He also hosted visitors from Africa. As, as the, the Pan-African Federation was reformed in Manchester in 1944 with McConan as the secretary. And this was one of the organizations that got the funding to be able to fund the 1945 Pan-African Congress. And this photograph is of McConan uh, standing with uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Profits, as I said, from these new activities went to finance the PAF, which then financed other activities like the Pan-African Congress. He also maintained old contacts and made new ones with political groups and activists, 
in Africa and the Caribbean. Now, McConan was such a, a great fundraiser that he also raised funds to bring the eminent Jamaican Norman Manley, who was Prime Minister of Jamaica later, to Britain to defend a Jamaican airman accused of murder. The man was acquitted. Norman Manley was actually an esteemed uh, lawyer at the time. Now, always using his profits to help his fellow blacks, McConan gave £5,000 to the founding of a home for the abandoned children fathered by black servicemen with white women who did not want to keep their mixed race children. He sought to uplift the whole of the black population, often at great personal cost and effort. When, when he established his restaurants in Manchester, he, he himself cleaned, repaired and decorated the restaurant, the first restaurant with furniture from local Hungarians, funds from Alfred Gazy. Alfred Gazy was one of those people he met in Manchester that helped him. And there's a lot, there's some information now about him. And, uh, and also a few friends from Liverpool and his flatmates. In total, they had a budget of £65, which in today's money would be £4,358.20p. 20, 20 he then lobbied local uh, Labour MPs and others for spare money. Within a month or so, the restaurant was open for business featuring Ethiopian and other African and English foods. His customers included black soldiers who had come over for the war from America and from the Caribbean, um, and they was mainly stationed in Warrington. Uh, black people living locally, um, he had a growing circle of friends and acquaintances. His restaurant become, became the only restaurant in Manchester serving African cuisine. A second restaurant um, was opened later on, and his restaurant, um, Nat King Cole and his daughter came to his restaurant, and so did Joe Lewis, the famous boxer. It had become the centre of Manchester's black social scene by then. And then later on, um, it, there is a plaque um, at the where the Fifth Pan-African Congress happened in All Saints in Manchester, and his name is on that plaque, along with the uh, Nkrumah, Amy Garvey, the first wife, uh, one of the wives of Marcus Garvey, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, um, W.B. Du Bois and uh, Boyce and George Padmore. He went, to, he then went to Ghana to help um, and advised um, um, Nkrumah when he became president of, um, Prime Minister, President of Ghana. And then later on, he was arrested in Ghana after there was a coup in 1966. He became a citizen of, of um, Tanzania, uh, a citizen of Kenya in 1969, and he died in Nairobi in 1983. So that's Rasma, uh, T. Conan. The next people I'm going to speak about, and I'll have to get a move on. Got 10 minutes, I think, 11 minutes. Dyke and Dryden. You may have heard of Dyke and Dryden. Uh, you've seen their uh, products on the shelves, possibly way back in the day. Uh, for those people who are who are not who are not as um, old who are as old as me or near enough, um, their story is one of unprecedented black enterprise in the sixties, but shows they were truly trailblazers who succeeded in building. Britain's first black multi-million pound business enterprise. And this is a picture of them. You've got Len Dyke, Dudley Dryden, and then later they brought in Tony Wade to do a lot of the marketing. And so literally it was the three of them, but we call it Dyke and Dryden. It, uh, interestingly enough, if every other black business you encounter in the, end, in the ends is a barber shop, a hairdressing salon or some nail hair nail combo it is because dyke and dryden opened the door for them they were loved by the community and served it when no one else would before they became big they were in the record business they sold records and cosmetics but when and then tony wade joined them 
and they had a joint venture uh, where he, he recommended that the team put the record business aside and focus on black hair and skin products, as he understand that this was at the time the rising star in the 60s. And so to some extent, they put aside the record shop and decided to move into this in a big way. So their hustle saw them enjoy amazing growth growing from Tottenham as a, a shop in Tottenham into places like Atney, whilst other also opening outlets in London, Birmingham and partnering with local pharmacists, chemists. And you can see the Afro comb, uh, super curl, all those things are things they used to actually bring into the country. They used to import all of these things. And this is why we had had these things in the country. To add to their success, the team shook hands with notable figures like Margaret Thatcher, launched the Afro Hair and Beauty Expo in the 80s and created beauty contests and travel services for Caribbean people. And there is a black plaque, um, the Nubian Jack black plaque, plaque, plaque uh, uh, honoring them. Dyke and Dryden imported their goods from places like New York, Chicago and Atlanta. They created the network and supplied their, uh, their, their UK community. With a deep understanding of what the people wanted, the trio saw the opportunity to create innovative products. Um, and um, they created the first perm gel ever formulated and developed in the UK under the name Super Supreme Curl. Hair fashion was changing and the trio pitched the idea for a new type of curl to Paul Davis, a manufacturing chemist based in South London and owner of Tor Chemicals. They also developed a relaxing system for the straight look, which got, the, got, the, got off the ground when Soft Sheen Products of Chicago bought a controlling interest in their company. It was a success, especially in Ghana, Uganda and Holland. Many of the niche products on the natural beauty products helped their expansion in East and West African markets. Some of the best selling Afrocombs um, were um, brought through, through those, um, were sold or brought, brought through those markets. The trio even began selling a must-have accessory of the 1970s, the Afro comb, that was a symbol of pride for the Afro itself. Many suppliers originally rejected the idea, but thanks to their tenacity, they were able to convince a factory that eventually uh, couldn't keep up with the demand. So the arrival of hair of hair shop Dyke and Dryden in Tottenham in the 1960s, Britain's first black owned multi-million pound business helped create a mass market for Afro combs after it teamed up with a Nigerian company, Nigerian company to exclu exclusively distribute them. Whilst Dyke, Dyke and Dryden Limited retail distributed and later manufactured their products for the African, Car the African Caribbean community, they eventually sold up and left room for second movers to fill the demand. Today, business men from the South Asian community are prominent in the wholesale and retail parts of the supply chain because they have provided what black people want and made it more accessible. Now, just um, let me check. They were able to also, they were able to work together successfully. They, they had a real good business work, professional business working relationship. They added value in communities too, which included supporting lawyers, partnering with chemists and bringing their friend Tony Wade into the venture. In a supply chain where you're moving goods from manufacturing, distribution, retail, and to the consumer, many variables play a part in getting goods out the door. No market is perfect, said Tony, Tony Wade. Those who win are those who can serve their customers better than anyone else in the market. And today, many black owned retailers don't have much influence on the price because they haven't got much influence on other parts of the supply chain. This is a book that was written by Tony Wade and it's um, How They Made a Million, the Dyke and Dryden story. Okay, 
So that's um, about Dyke and Dryden. My final person that I'll be talking about is a living person, um, and she's called Margaret Busby. Um, now, I hadn't, I, I hadn't heard about Margaret Busby until um, a few years ago, and recently I, I was talking to her on LinkedIn, and she's an amazing person. Um, so Margaret Yvonne Busby was born in Ghana. She became Britain's, um, this 1944 she was born, uh, she became Britain's biggest, uh, youngest and first black woman publisher. She's now today deemed as a major cultural figure in Britain and around the world. She's also titled Nana Akua Akon and is a Ghanaian born publisher, editor, writer and broadcaster and resident of the UK. So she's, she's not just a publisher. She was Britain, as I said, she was Britain's youngest. Um, she co-founded uh, A and B or Alison and Busby with Clive uh, Allison, um, which is a London London based publishing house. In 2006, she got the OBE for services to literature and publishing. 2007, actually, I, I'll, I'll leave that for a while. I'll come back to that. This um, Margaret Busby was born in 1944, as I said, to Dr. George Busby and Mrs. Sarah Busby, nee Christian, who both had family links to the Caribbean, particularly to Trinidad, Barbados and Dominica. And this is a picture of George Alfred Busby. He's got a blue plaque in, Lo uh, in London also for his work in, in, um, in, in Britain as a doctor. Her relative, Margaret's relative, her cousin is Moira Stroot, the newsreader. Her grandfather was George James Christian, a delegate of the first Pan-African Congress conference, sorry, held in London in 1900, and then he migrated to the Gold Coast in 1902. From the age of 17, she studied English at Bedford College. Um, uh, where she edited her college literary uh, magazine as well as publishing her own poetry and graduated with a BA honours degree at the age of 20. She was married to British jazz musician and educator Lionel Grig Grigson. While still at university, she met future business partner Clive Allison, and this is a picture of them both, and they decided to start a publishing company. The first books were published in 1967, making her, as I said, the youngest publisher, as well as the first um, African-American book publisher in the UK. A uh, woman book publisher, sorry. Um, she was with Alison and Busby's editorial, uh, she was the editorial director for 20 years, publishing many notable authors, including Sam Greenlee, who authored a book called The Spooky Who Sat By The Door, which was about the, a book about the first person who, a black person, who was uh, employed by the CIA. And this novel would not be touched by anybody else, but uh, uh, um, Margaret actually decided to um, look into it. And eventually it was later, it was banned first of all, and later it was published. She's also published CLR James, Bukia Macheta, The Bride Price, I've read that. George Lamin, um, who else? Uh, famous um, uh, um, Caribbean uh, writer. Julius Lester, American writer. Matthew Sweeney, I'm not certain about Matthew Sweeney. His name sounds familiar, the name Sweeney. Anyway, uh, Jill Murphy, Claire Rayner, Clive Sinclair, Chris Searle, Andrew Salke, another uh, Caribbean writer, Harriet E. Wilson, and Miyamoto Musashi, Musashi. Subsequently, she uh, became after afterwards. She uh, after the thirty uh, the, uh, the twenty years, um, she then um, became editorial director of Earthscan, Earthscan, publishing titles by Franz Fanon, famous black writer, and many others before pursuing a, a freelance career as an editor, writer, and critic. As a journalist, she has written for 
the Guardian, mainly um, book, uh, mainly uh, obituaries, etc., um, of uh, people like Jessica Huntley, um, Jan Carew, Gwendolyn Brooks, Frank Frank Richlow from the the Mangrove Nine, August Wilson, the 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 the, the drama the playwright. Uh, also, she's written for the Observer, the Independent, the Sunday Times, the New Statesman, etc. Um, right. What else can I tell you? Over the span of her career, she has she has also um, been unrelenting in terms of campaigning for diversity in publishing. So she wrote Daughters of Africa in 1992 and New Daughters of Africa in 2019. And um, um, she compiled uh, Daughters of Africa. When I say she wrote it, she actually compiled it. It's an international anthology of words and writings by women of African descent from the ancient from ancient Egyptian to the present, described by Black Enterprise as a landmark, which uh, includes contributions in a range of genre by more than two hundred women. They pioneered the African writing, in which they were not simply writing stories about their families, communities, and countries, but they're also writing themselves into the African literary, literary history and African history, historiography. They claimed space for women's storytellers in this written form, and in some sense reclaimed the women's role as the creator and carrier of many African societies' narratives, considering that the traditional storytelling session was a woman's domain. Busby also edited a 2019 follow-up, which was New Daughters of Africa, which again had 200 women uh, writers, 200 plus women writers. A review in the Irish Times commented, New Daughters of Africa is indispensable because African voices have been silenced or diminished throughout history and women's voices even more so. She's also been involved in broadcasting. I won't go into all of this, um, you know, uh, radio, TV, etc. She's been doing that since the 60s. Uh, Break for Women on the BBC African Service, uh, Front Row, Open Book, Kaleidoscope, Woman's Hour, she's been on all of those, even the democracy now in the USA. Her writings for the stage include Sankofa, um, Ya Asantiwa, um, Warrior Queen, who I'll be talking about uh, in the next few weeks on my own course, um, and directed by uh, various people. Um, um, so she's had that. And she's also um, following the death of Maya Angelou, uh, who was a close friend of hers. Uh, she scripted a major tribute entitled Maya Angelou, a celebration, which took place on the 5th of October at the Royal Festival Hall during the South Bank Centre's London Literature Festival. And that was directed by Paulette Randall, one of our, our, our uh, female directors in this country and chaired by John Snow and Moira Stewart, her cousin. The celebration featured contributions from artists, including Adora Ando, uh, Angel Colby, etc., uh, etc. Et okay. So that's um, my four um, people, black people, who have contributed to um, a black business in. Britain. So I hope that was useful in some way. <laughs>